Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Today is very special for you. You have been selected to be one of the founders of Starbase Mars. You will be one of the 30 highly trained astronauts to fly on the first starship to land on Mars. The Academy has been tasked with preparing your starship orientation training. Some of this information will be known to you, but please pay close attention. DesignFreedom.Space is an architectural design company for space, providing design solutions for space stations, habitats, and other crude environments. Using Design Freedom's concept, this incredible interactive virtual tour was created using software provided by my three ideas, with the flight deck and crew pods modeled by Dale Rutherford. Links are found in the description. Design Freedom has been kind enough to prepare this incredible virtual tour of a starship that has been equipped for deep space operations. As you know, the starship itself is the second stage of the starship system. The starship is 50 meters tall and is launched atop a 70 meter tall booster called Super Heavy. This is a starship and booster ready to launch. The booster fires, carrying the starship above most of Earth's atmosphere. Then the booster separates and returns to land. The starship will now fire its engines, taking you and the rest of the crew on into orbit. Here you see the starship in orbit. And here you see it from a little distance. The starship will have six levels. Here you can see them laid out. We'll use these as guides as we complete our orientation. These levels will be oriented for planetary operations, meaning they are built for you to be upright while on Earth, or after landing on the Moon or Mars. The design has also been configured for use in zero gravity. These will be designated as levels 1 through 6. We will start at the top and work our way down. As we pass through the wall of the Starship into level 6, we see the flight deck. The flight deck can accommodate 10 flight crew seats with five display and control screens. These have a horizontal viewing screen for planetary operations and a vertical viewing screen for launch operations. These are similar to the system's control screens on the Dragon capsules. Using the additional volume in the Starship, the area for the flight crew can be expanded allowing for a large viewing window, which would be protected by an internal shield recessed within the bulkhead above, to protect against solar radiation, micrometeoroids, and space debris. Here you see the system's reporting and control functions being displayed. If you are a member of the flight crew, this is where you will be at launch. Most Starship operations will be automated. It will be your job to monitor the systems and react to emergencies. Before flight and maneuvers, the flight seats would rotate upwards, allowing access to the horizontal display controls and aligning the crew's body to the direction of G-forces experienced in flight. Adding to the functionality of the flight deck, each station has a fold-up work surface to allow crew members additional surface area for personal tablets and other equipment. Primarily designed for positive G activities, the top of the desk would have a light magnetic surface to secure items in zero gravity. If we look up, we see that there is a circular grip bar to help us maintain our position or get around in zero gravity. Here you see storage compartments. In these you will find emergency equipment and other necessary gear. Above this, are the liquid methane and liquid oxygen header tanks. These are needed for propulsive landing on planets and provide extra radiation shielding for long duration missions. Down here you see the central core. This Starship version does not have nose docking, so it starts here and goes all the way through to the lower decks. Let's move on down now to the next level. This is level five. Level 5 is a community dining and briefing area. Here you see a bench along the hull, with tables here 
and another set of inner benches here. These can be folded away when not in use. For briefings or entertainment, the crew can sit in the outer benches and close these two screens. These panels provide extra radiation and impact protection, while having two large status screens that can come together to form one large screen. On this level, you will also find the food preparation and storage area. Over here, you see the food storage units. The four storage units contain short-term food supplies, restocked from long-term storage on levels one and two. Each of these large storage units here has an internal volume of about 3.5 cubic meters. The smaller ones are about 2.5. It takes about 0.62 kilograms of dehydrated food per day to keep the average person healthy. The best example of dehydrated meals are what the American military calls MREs. This stands for Meals Ready to Eat, which is a very optimistic assessment. These are plastic bags containing different dehydrated food packets. Here you see what these look like. Each of these packs has an average mass of 0.683 kilograms and takes up a volume of 0.00332 cubic meters each. If we plan on a 600-day mission to get to Mars during one alignment and return on another, we would need about 498 kilograms of food per person. For 30 people, that would be about 14,940 kilograms or almost 15 metric tons. Food takes up more room than almost anything else on a long-duration space mission. If each packet needs 0.00332 cubic meters of volume, we would need about 54 cubic meters of food storage. We don't have that much space in the pressurized area of the ship, but we only need to carry enough food on the ship for the journey to Mars. For 180 days, that would be a little more than 16 cubic meters. We have about 21 cubic meters of storage in our large storage units. With our water, we would have filled 17 of them, leaving four for other supplies. Once we land, we will have access to the large pressurized storage areas at the base of the ship. The food we will need on Mars and to return will be stored here. We will restock the interior of the ship before departure. By the way, I go into detail about space science nutrition in this lesson and cover space medicine in these. Now we also need to rehydrate the food. It takes about 1.2 liters of water, which would be 1.2 kilograms, to rehydrate all the food each person would need per day. And everyone needs to drink at least 2.5 kilograms of water per day to stay healthy. We also need to clean, but if we use personal wipes for hygiene and just a little extra water for brushing our teeth, we are looking at about 4 kilograms of water per day per person. The Apollo missions only took a little water up with them then used their hydrogen oxygen fuel cells to produce water for the trip. We will have solar panels, but we might also use some of the methane fuel and liquid oxygen in a molten carbonate fuel cell, giving us electricity, water, and carbon dioxide. This would also give us an emergency water supply. The International Space Station takes water up in resupply missions, but we won't have any resupply missions. Some water will also be used in a radiation shelter that we will show you in a minute. This is another possible emergency source of water. At four kilograms per person per day, we find that if we brought all the water we needed for 30 people for just one day, we would need 120 kilograms of water. If we recycle the water with a 10% loss per day, we would lose 12 kilograms per day. But almost all of that is lost to the air and evaporation. Our dehumidifiers can get back at least 80% of that. Realistically, over time, it would be a lot less than this. As this is a sealed environment, any water absorbed into fabrics and surfaces would reach an equilibrium point pretty quickly. If we have a 10-day reserve on board, that would require 1.2 metric tons of water. With another 1.2 tons to replace losses, we end up with 2.4 metric tons of water on launch. If our large containers hold 2.6 cubic meters of volume, that would be more than enough. One of these containers could hold the water we needed at launch at one ton per cubic meter. 
The food can then be prepared using one of the four food prep points, seen here, to allow multiple crew members to prepare meals simultaneously. These dispense hot and cold water and have microwaves and toaster ovens for meal preparation. You get to this level by coming through this central core. You can see that this central core has two hatches, giving the ability to partition sections within a level if required, and allowing the crew line of sight through the hatches, adding to the perception of space. To maximize usable space and allow for positive and zero-g circulation, the functional equipment and storage are located together on the windward side of the ship. As the largest communal area on the ship, the crew would convene here for social events or mission briefings. Looking back at the central core, we see a vertical access ladder, which also functions as a cargo lift to help transport supplies and equipment between levels when restocking on planets. Each level also has a communications and systems rack, which has a touchscreen display and control monitor, and an emergency medical station, seen here. These will contain solid fuel oxygen candles, emergency lithium hydroxide canisters, and other first aid and emergency supplies. A human being needs about 0.83 kilograms of oxygen per day. Over a 600-day mission, our entire crew would need at least 15 tons of oxygen. But we won't need to carry all of this with us in the pressurized area. Human beings create water out of glucose and oxygen, about 1.2 kilograms per day. Some of this could be hydrolyzed into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen could be put back into the ship's atmosphere, and the hydrogen could be used in the Sabatier process to remove carbon dioxide from the air. We pass down now to level four. For the simulation, we pass out of and back into the ship. In space, you will, of course, travel through the central core. Level four contains the personal crew pods. These will be utilized for rest and sleeping as well as providing some personal space. There are 20 pods on two tiers, all equipped with privacy and acoustic shutters. The ship is designed for a third of the crew to be in a sleep shift, while the other 20 are either on duty or carrying out personal activities. Here you see the monitoring display interface for rotation allocation and intercom. These pods have been designed to maximize interior space providing a comfortable seated or supine orientation. It is in these chambers that the non-flight crew will belt themselves in for launch operations and major course corrections. These pods will provide a necessary personal refuge during the long flight to Mars. The leeward side of the ship will have windows for the pods. The windward or re-entry side will have display screens. Here you can see that the central core has been enlarged to accommodate 15 seated crew members. This is a short-term shelter for use during a solar storm. And up here are bulkhead storage units to provide additional mission storage, emergency supplies, and backup life support equipment. Now we move down to level three. Level three is the wet area of the ship. This is where we have zero gravity hygiene cubicles with toilet and washing facilities. The water storage and recycling systems will be in these units. Here you see an exercise area to maintain fitness. Fitness is critical to survival in zero G due to the effect of prolonged exposure to zero G on the body. Crew members are required to exercise for two hours a day on average to prevent bone and muscle loss. Six multi-use zero-G fitness machines are located next to the windows, and each workout station can be stowed flat on the floor, enabling this area to be used for alternative functions. Above the fitness area are additional storage bulkheads for equipment, supplies, or systems access. The central core here is identical to level four, allowing for a second shelter which together provides all 30 of the crew members with a refuge in an emergency. The core external walls could be used for vertical hydroponics to add a soft natural element to the space and improve food and air quality. Here the vertical access ladder lift within has retractable sections between floors to allow the recessed deck hatches to close in the event of an emergency. Now down to level two. 
This is the science and storage area. This level uses the International Standard Payload Rack, ISPR system. The interior perimeter has eight ISPRs, nine multi-use fixed storage racks, and seven to 12 individual storage units that run on a rolling track to allow access to the units behind. Some fixed units would also have a medical bay with a treatment bed and life support equipment housed vertically inside one to two units and pulled down when required. Foldable partitions would extend to segment the allocated space during treatment. When working at a science ISPR, a pullout seat and work surface between the frames would allow crew members to sit in positive G or aid station keeping in zero G. Level two is where the central core ends and second vertical access allows access to level one. Utilizing the same ladder lift system, cargo and supplies can be transported from level one to five when in positive G. Now we go to level one. Level one is for extravehicular activity and storage. The extravehicular activity level is divided into two main areas, a storage bay and an EVA lot, allowing access to the surface via an extendable lift system. The vertical access from level two has an adjacent communication systems rack consisting of a touchscreen monitor and an emergency medical station. The rest of the perimeter is used for large to medium cargo storage. This would include uniforms, clothing, personal items, towels, wipes, trash bags, and medications. A lot goes into planning a space mission. Along each side of the outer edge of the EVA are six exploration extra mobility unit style spacesuits, which are accessed via their independent airlock. If we go back here, we can see that we enter the suits from the back. This prevents contamination of the entire ship. Additional suits would be kept in storage as extras or for other crew or in case of suit malfunction. Next to the suit access hatches, are two sample return decontamination storage units that can be accessed on both sides of the airlock to allow the crew to safely deposit science equipment or samples. The airlock doors are the same size, allowing for large equipment transfers to and from the surface. This is done by using a lift system that extends beyond the ship and lowers down to the surface. An alternative variation could have the airlock and lift extended to accommodate a six crew rover. It is very important that you familiarize yourself with every aspect of the Starship you will be flying to Mars. If you would like to take your own interactive tour of this Starship interior, you can find the link in the description. Enjoy your flight and stay safe. This concludes your orientation training for your Mars-bound Starship at Astro Proterra.